Hello, uh, Brink Lindsay. Hi, this Glenn. Is Glenn. How are you? Hey, man, I'm doing well. Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv, also teach at Brown University, talking with Brink Lindsay, who will introduce himself. I'm uh, with a vice president at the Cato uh, Institute, vice president for research. That is a noble and uh, influential position, Brink. And it makes you an economist, if not by card-carrying PhD, then by professional practice and uh, and your social acumen. Yeah, um, I, I say I'm not an economist, but I sometimes play one on TV. Uh, but yes, I do. <laughs> I, I do not have an economics PhD. I'm a recovering lawyer, uh, but I do write a lot about economics and economic policy. So uh, I try to get it right. No, I mean, I think you certainly get it interesting. And if you don't get it right, I'm not the one to tell you so. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I'll tell you, I'm an academic economist. I've been doing this for almost 40 years. And uh, when I was reading your stuff, uh, the pieces that you've been writing about the issues you've been concerned about most recently, which is productivity growth in the United States and the factors that may be inhibiting it, I felt humbled because I thought, all of the hand waving, equation writing, and you know theorizing that I do day to day as an academic economist doesn't come close to being as useful or interesting <laughs> as, some of, <laughs> as some of the stuff that you're doing. Well, so <laughs> I, d I doubt that. But uh, but uh, yeah, the the issues that I've been working on of late are, are I think important and ones that are going to be uh, increasingly. Uh, on people's minds as we go forward, and that is basically that uh, economic growth in the United States seems to be slowing down. Uh, we know that uh, we just went through an awful recession, and we have thus far been uh, slogging through a, a very sluggish and unsatisfactory recovery. Uh, growth seems to have picked up of late, but uh, but we're still way off trend and, and show no real signs of catching up to the long-term trend. Indeed, all the long-term growth forecasts are showing uh, growth rates well below our historical average. Uh, so I've been uh, doing a fair amount of work on my own and also convening conferences and uh, getting other people, uh, commissioning other people to work on this uh, to try to figure out uh, what's what's amiss and what we might do about it. OK, well, I definitely want to hear about that. But can I start by asking you why this matters, why growth is so critical um, an aspect of economic policy that uh, we, you should be spending as much of your time on it as you are? Uh, sure. Uh, so in general, uh, growth is great because it makes us all better off. Uh, it's it's uh, growing uh, output per head that makes possible uh, the rise in material standards of living. Uh, it also makes possible uh, social policies uh, that uh, that can be funded uh, from uh, from taxation. Uh, so uh, not only do people earn higher market incomes uh, as a result of economic growth, uh, but the government has more resources uh, to redistribute income uh, in the event of higher growth. So whether uh, you're a rah-rah private sector supporter uh, on the economic right or whether you're a big believer in redistribution on the left, uh, you need a bigger pie, uh, and a bigger pie is better uh, either because uh, of, of the people who earn it uh, or because of the possibility for redistributing it. Um, okay, and so uh, basically, uh, there is a, a rule of, of 70. Uh, you uh, take whatever the growth rate is uh, and divide, that, divide 70 by that, and you get the number of years uh, it takes for incomes to double. So uh, if in, if if incomes uh, are growing uh, at uh, at two percent a year, uh, income will double uh, in thirty five years. If they only grow one percent a year, then they double uh, in seventy years. So basically, it's a question of whether incomes double or quadruple over your lifetime, and uh, and that's a big difference. Okay, so the kind of economics I do tells me that the logarithm of two is where the rule of 70 comes from. <laughs> we, I'm sorry, we say wanna, that again. I couldn't hear you. I, I said, uh, I know nothing about the actual facts on growth, but what I yeah. do know is that the rule of 70 derives from the fact that 70 is approximately the logarithm of two times 100. That's, that's right, yes. <laughs> so so from, from as far back as we have uh, plausible statistics, uh, the long-term growth rate of, of inflation-adjusted or real Gross domestic product GDP per capita uh, has been uh, two percent a year. Uh, 
Uh, and if you uh, if you graph that out over a, 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 from like 1870 to 2010, uh, it, the slope of that uh, of that line remains remarkably constant. There's squiggles uh, that are the macroeconomic fluctuations of booms and busts that absorb all of our attention in the short term. But those squiggles all even out. There's a huge squiggle in the 30s and then a huge squiggle upward in the uh, 40s. Uh, but that evens out, too. So we've had dr- remarkable consistency of I- improving GDP per uh, uh, per capita of 2% a year uh, for something like 140 years. Um, did you, did but, you say two uh, looking or three? At, looking, at, looking ahead, it's looking much more like one to one and a half percent growth rather than 2% growth. And, and that's a big difference adding up over time. I just want to be clear. I heard you. You said 2%, not 3%, 2 Two percent per capita. Two percent per capita. Yeah. Okay. And now you're saying the projection is one to one and a half percent, which is significantly lower. And so now we're going to talk about that. Let me, as a sidebar, just ask you about um, capital in the 21st century. Uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, R bigger than G, two percent is less than the real rate of return on investment during most of that period that you're talking about, I would have to assume uh, does that mean anything to you? Uh, I don't put a lot of stock in the R is greater than G, uh, Piketty, uh, uh, master equation. Um, so, uh, even, uh, even Piketty recognizes that for the United States, that, uh, that, uh, uh equation doesn't have much to do with explaining, uh, American inequality. American inequality has all been about a huge run up in labor incomes, uh, much right. more so than it has been a run up in, in income from capital. Uh, so, uh, so I, I don't think, I, I think, uh, Piketty at best, uh, is a preview of, of the, the 21st century, uh, rather than any kind of description of what happened in the 20th. Okay. One more question as a preliminary matter, which is when I hear people in development, uh, economics, writing about the miracle of transformation in India or China, they're talking growth at 8%, 9%, yeah. 10% a year. This is mind boggling to me. And I, I just wonder uh, whether or not the, the growth calculus that uh, you're, uh, you know, uh, analyzing and that you're going to tell us about uh, sheds any light on the remarkable things that seem to be happening, much, much higher growth rates. Can they be sustained over a substantial period of time, et cetera, that we're seeing in other parts of the world? Yeah, those very high growth rates in China and India and, and other less developed countries are uh, uh, caused by what uh, Alexander Gershenkron once called the the, the uh, uh, ad- advantage of backwardness. Uh, that is, uh, because you're starting from a low base, because you're starting uh, as a poor, underdeveloped, technologically unsophisticated economy, you can grow faster than economies at the technological frontier uh, simply by uh, copying and adapting technologies and uh, and uh, organizational forms uh, from uh, more advanced countries uh, to uh, conditions at home. Uh, so it's 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 easier to imitate than it is to innovate. Uh, therefore, uh, less advanced countries can grow faster uh, than uh, than more advanced countries through so-called catch-up growth, and, and that produces the phenomenon of convergence. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the United States, through all of its history, has been a frontier economy, or at least uh, through all the history we're talking about, uh, beginning with the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and so uh, it, growth is necessarily uh, slower here. Uh, because uh, we have to make up everything as we go along. We have to do the, the hard work of clearing the frontier uh, and uh, and moving forward, and that's a that's a slower business. I see. Um, oh. There are uh, and that frontier can is ultimately cleared by coming up with new ideas, new technologies, new ways of doing things, new products. Uh, that uh, that is the fundamental uh, driver of long term economic growth. Unless we come up with uh, new goods. Uh, new services, new ways of doing things, uh, ultimately, uh, diminishing returns will kick in. And even if we put more labor and more capital to, uh, to doing the same things over and over, eventually uh, growth will stop. It's technological uh, progress, broadly understood, that makes long-term growth possible. Okay. And I want to talk about why you think we're slowing down, but I've got yet another preliminary question, uh, which is, if indeed 
uh, growth over the long term in an advanced economy depends on moving the frontier forward. That is, new ideas, new methods of production, new new uh, devices, new ways of consuming and spending time and all this kind of thing. How could one predict that? How could one be confident in making any statement about the future of something that we don't really know? No one would have predicted the Internet in 1980, this kind of thing. Uh, that's absolutely true. So ultimately, uh, any, quote, predictions about economic growth are just projections, projections according to various assumptions. Uh, the uh, to, to break it down, uh, uh, output consists most basically of, uh, of, uh, of hours worked uh, per capita on the one hand uh, and output per hour on the other. Um, so on the on the left hand side, on the hours worked side, uh, those demographic factors are are, are uh, move relatively slowly. Uh, our ability to predict 100 years out is certainly imperfect, but our ability to predict 10 or 20 years out is pretty good. Um, on the other side, output per hour, uh, there are some things that influence that are that are uh, more predictable, like uh, schooling levels. You get higher output per worker hour with uh, better educated, uh, more highly skilled workers. Um, capital per worker uh, uh, also increases output. But the, the final magic ingredient is, is innovation, so-called total factor productivity growth. Uh, and nobody can predict that at all. In fact, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the basic history is that in the quarter century after World War II, we had very robust, very fast productivity growth, which drove the kind of golden age of economic growth in that quarter century after World War II. Starting in the 1970s, productivity growth slowed down for reasons that still uh, economists uh, are scratching their head trying to figure out. <coughs> uh, it, it, it revived uh, in from about 1996 to about 2004, uh, thanks to the Internet. We're pretty clear why it revived. Uh, but uh, but even as it was reviving, uh, most economists missed the uptick. They didn't know it was happening. Uh, uh, so it took everybody by surprise. Um and then it went away again in the mid O's and that took people by surprise. So we're absolutely hopeless. We're worse than useless at predicting productivity growth. Uh, all we can say uh, these days uh, is that because of demographic factors that are slowing growth down, we would need like historically high levels of productivity growth to compensate. I'll explain more about that in a second. Uh, and we we don't see those right now. They could come tomorrow, uh, but uh, we shouldn't expect them. Uh, we should expect productivity growth that, to look something like it's looked over the last 10 or 20 years. And if it does, then we're going to have slower growth. OK, let me let me stop you for a minute. So there's an identity here. I think it's worth emphasizing that you know, this is not really theory. This is just accounting. Yeah. Uh, growth depends upon the number of hours worked per capita and the amount of output per hour work, we multiply those two things together and we get the amount of output per capita. That's an identity. Yeah. You, you say one of those things has mostly to do with demographic uh, aspects, that is, hours work. For example, do mothers uh, take on jobs? Uh, do people, you know, uh, work overtime, uh, labor force participation of prime age adult males, this kind of thing? Yeah. And then the other of those things has to do has to do with, well, what are the tools that people are working with? That's what you're going to call, I imagine, capital deepening. And then what is the uh, productivity of the worker and the tool put together? This depends on how smart we are about making use of the resources that we have. And that's technological innovation. So we've yeah. got these three so different things that are driving growth. And if you want to predict growth in the future... You can do so by predicting what you think the trends will be in these three different factors. Yeah. So most of the popular discussion in the last couple of years about whether we're whether this slow growth is the new normal uh, has focused on that last part. Are, are we running out of good ideas? Is innovation running out? Uh, and uh, the most celebrated doomsayer along those lines is uh, Northwestern economist uh, Bob Gordon, uh, who has been arguing uh, that. Uh, that the innovations of the late 19th and early 20th century were unparalleled in their transformative power to raise uh, living standards. Nothing that's happened in our lifetimes remotely uh, resembles uh, 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 that technological explosion uh, and its transformative power. The Internet just isn't as 
big a deal as the internal combustion engine, uh, electricity, modern chemistry, uh, et cetera, all put together. Uh, and so uh, he uh, posits uh, that the era of modern economic growth that started in the Industrial Revolution in England in the 1700s uh, isn't going to go on forever. It's going to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and we're coming towards the end because we're running out of of, of transformative new ideas. Uh, I personally uh, 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 do not buy that kind of doom saying. Uh, I'm not pessimistic at all about uh, future, uh, uh, p- the potential for future transformative technological innovations. Um, and for sure, nobody has the slightest idea uh, what uh, our technologies will look like 50 years from now. So it's all just guessing. Uh, my own reasons for being pessimistic about the medium term growth outlook uh, are demographic factors. Uh, first, that. Oh, output, oh, uh, Brent, uh, excuse me. B- before you go on, I, I definitely want to hear what you're going to say about the demographic factors. But I wanted yeah. to ask you something about Bob Gordon, who, as it happens, was a teacher of mine when I was an undergraduate 45 years ago at Northwestern University. Yes. Um, which is, do you grant his premise that the internet and all that goes with that, uh, the modern information uh, technology revolution and communications revolution and networking revolution is not as big a deal as the internal combustion engine or uh, whatever DuPont is doing with those chemicals to to make our lives better or uh, electrification or... Yes, Uh, I'm much more sympathetic with Bob's historical assessment of the relative potency of the second industrial revolution versus this third industrial revolution um, than I than I am about his uh, his uh, predictions about the future. Uh, So I I buy that technological progress is lumpy, uh, that sometimes big things happen. Other times we're kind of working out the implications of those big things, but other big things haven't really rolled along yet. Yeah. Uh, for sure, the 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 clusters of of innovations in the late 19th, early 20th centuries were absolutely transformative, completely changed the human condition. Um, and uh, and I I don't think so. F- and, and I think that uh, they were so potent and so fertile uh, that they allowed innovators to continue teasing out the implications of those core innovations for many decades. For decades and that by the 1970s, uh, we had. We had more or less played them out. Uh, and so I, I buy into the idea that the productivity slowdown in the 70s uh, uh, reflected the maturing of, of, of uh, those earlier innovations and the lack of anything uh, uh, spectacular to replace it. Uh, and I, I buy that thus far, uh, the Internet and associated IT uh, computing revolution uh Although it's a general purpose technology that influences uh, output on, throughout uh, all different sectors of the economy, uh, just like those earlier innovations, it's just one as opposed to several of them. Uh, so uh, I, I buy that it's uh, that it's thus far its effect uh, uh, does not uh, equal uh, that of uh, of uh, the innovations of a hundred years ago. Uh, but okay. looking forward, I, I think the uh, the possibilities of radical transformation uh, are, are still kind of eye popping and, and mind boggling. And therefore, uh, I uh, I'm in no mood to close the patent office just yet. <laughs> OK, so tell us about your concerns about demographic trends making you somewhat pessimistic. And then perhaps we can return to this question about the patent office being a busy place in the decades ahead. OK, um, so. uh <laughs> The uh, U.S. growth experience of the 20th century uh, profited from two major uh, tailwinds that helped to propel growth, uh, both demographic factors. Uh, one, uh, the uh, the move of women out of the home and into the paid workplace. Uh, the One of the easiest ways, one of the most straightforward ways to get more uh, GDP per capita is to get a higher and higher percentage of your population making GDP for a living. Uh, and that's what we did uh, 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 via the rising uh, workforce participation rates of women over the course of the 20th century and especially uh, during the 60s and 70s. Excuse me for interrupting, but I just have to ask you something about that. Does that mean that we're not counting as whatever the women were doing at home before moving into the workplace in greater numbers as contributing to GDP? 
Yeah, so that's important. GDP measures the, uh, and this is simplified because GDP is an incredibly complicated uh, 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 statistical artifact. Uh, yeah. But basically, it measures the market value of goods and services uh, that are traded for dollars. Uh, and so uh, domestic home work uh, doesn't count. Yeah, okay. Um, and I don't want to make a big deal out of this, but I think that many of us would be a little concerned that we've got the right picture because certainly the well-being of people depends upon domestic production. I mean, we're talking about caring for elderly parents, raising sure. children, things of this kind. This is certainly important to our lives, even though it's not traded for dollars and therefore not counted as a matter of gross domestic product. Uh, uh, I, so I, that, I agree completely, yeah. uh, but... Um, so GDP leaves GDP does not equal well-being, and it's uh, perhaps an increasingly flawed measure. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Uh, okay. But uh, but the increase in GDP is overstated uh, by because it counted <clears throat> the increase uh, that occurred because of women's move into the workforce was overstated because uh, the the value of the work they had been doing uh, uh, went to was always counted uh, as zero. Yeah. Um, but, okay. Sorry to interrupt. Clearly, yeah. there clearly there were huge gains uh, in in allowing women to uh, who were basically consigned to one job, a uh, homemaker, uh, to specialize uh, throughout the whole range of occupations. Uh, and so we absolutely we absolutely got a big jolt to output uh, by bringing women into the workforce. We also got a, a subsidiary jolt to the workforce thanks to the baby boom, which uh, kicked in in the '60s. Uh, to start uh, uh, accelerating the growth of our of our labor force. So just okay. in terms of having a higher percentage of the population making uh, uh, GDP, uh, we did that over the 20th century. Um, labor force uh, participation rates peaked uh, at the end of the 90s. Uh, they fell during the 2000-2001 recession. Although they recovered some during the subsequent recovery, they ne by 2007, they never got back to where they were in 2000. So we had a whole uh, economic expansion with declining labor force participation. Uh, then uh, with the uh, Great Recession of 2008, we had a huge spike in unemployment and fall in labor force participation. And yeah. uh, although we've had uh, declining unemployment uh, since uh, 2010 or 11, uh, uh, we haven't had really any increase in labor force participation. It stayed very low. Uh, so the percentage of people uh, in the workforce today uh, is about the same as it was uh, around 1980. So we we gave up, uh, we gave back about 20 years of gains in labor force participation, and we haven't gotten it back. Um, maybe okay. it will return. Maybe it will return slowly, uh, uh, but and maybe it will <clears throat> regain the old peak level. Uh, but further growth is unlikely, just as a matter of math, as uh, uh, women could converge more. Uh, but the long term trend uh, has been. Uh, on the male side, has been for a slow, steady decrease in labor force participation, yes. thanks to good things like spending more time in school or earlier retirement. Uh, so uh, this kind of increasing mobilization of the workforce that helped propel growth in the 20th century is unlikely to be uh, available to us uh, in the so, 21st. Now, let me, before you go on, we're talking about the demographic factors contributing to growth, and you're observing that. Uh, women's movement into the labor force is pretty much exhausted uh, as a source of increased uh, uh, labor power in the economy and that the baby boom has played itself out as well. And so there's yeah. reason to be pessimistic. But what I want to ask you here before we go on to talk about, um, you know, uh, capital deepening and about technological change in the future is whether you think that social programs which are commendable in terms of their humanitarian intent of making it easier for people to have decent lives without working are therefore perhaps or could be a drag on growth to the extent that they allow adult males who are of prime working age to uh, be able to survive nonetheless because they've got health care or they've got income supplements or other kinds of uh, social benefits uh, that make not being in the labor force a, a more viable option for themselves. Yeah, I, I think that uh, for there are a variety of reasons to be concerned about the, uh, the you know, growing tenuousness of the attachment of of uh, less educated males to the workforce. Uh, uh, first, uh, if we do have uh, uh, an ongoing secular decline in labor force participation, 
uh, caused not just by good things like spending more time in school and early retirement, but caused by demoralization uh, because of uh, the uh, lack of availability of jobs that pay decently uh, and and therefore uh, just dropping out of the workforce, going on to the disability roles or somehow or another uh, getting by uh, without steady employment, uh, then uh, first, uh, that is a terrible tragedy for the people involved. I think uh, uh, the, uh, yeah. the, the <clears throat> social science is pretty clear that just about the worst thing that can happen to you uh, in uh, the contemporary uh, advanced country is to lose your job. Uh, unemployed people are not happy. Unemployed people don't spend yes. their time, don't spend their free time in really constructive and uh, ways that conduce to human flourishing. Instead, they sleep more and they watch a lot of TV. Uh, and they feel really bad about themselves because they're yeah. not part of the uh, the larger society's uh, productive work. Uh, so uh, I think that there are uh, there are <clears throat> there are good uh, benign reasons uh, why uh, labor force petition may uh, may decline over time. Even though they are benign, they will have costs to all of us because they will slow down growth. Uh, so we don't want to have unnecessary. Uh, artificial depression of uh, workforce participation. And we have that uh, very much so in the form of a whole bunch of social policies uh, that uh, that are biased against work. We we tax uh, work uh, through payroll taxes and income taxes rather than taxing yeah. consumption. Uh, we have very high implicit marginal tax rates on a lot of our means tested social benefits as they phase out. That acts like a like a very high tax rate and discourages uh, people from working. Yeah. Um, the disability insurance is uh, you can't get it unless you permanently drop out of the workforce. So it has a very strong anti-work incentive. Uh, so our our policies now are larded up with anti-work incentives that are they're pushing, I think, in a very bad direction. Yeah. Let me ask you about immigration right quick before, again, we move on to the capital evening and the technological change. We're talking about factors associated with the trend in the size of the labor force or the number of hours worked per capita. And um, I'm just wondering whether one can't cast a liberal position on immigration policy in light of it's good for all of us because given that traditional sources of growth in labor uh, in, in the amount of labor available to uh, produce goods in the economy is uh, have uh, are playing themselves out. Here is a new source. We're not going to have any more kids et cetera, et cetera. But we've got people on our border who are hungry to come in and contribute to producing goods in our economy. If we let them in, that would allow economic growth to be, uh, uh, you know, greater. And that will be for the benefit of all of us. Well, l let me state, first off, that I'm very much in favor of uh, much more liberal immigration rules than we have at present and more more liberal across the board for, for low-skilled people as well as high-skilled people. Okay. Uh, that said, uh, for sure, immigration can boost aggregate output. You get more inputs, more workers, you get more output. Uh, that's easy. Uh, the question is whether it will actually it can actually increase output per capita. Uh, and there it's much less clear that mass immigration of low skilled workers, which is most of what we've had uh, in this wave of immigration since the 1960s, uh, whether that really leads to higher uh, output per head. Uh, in fact, these you actually depress median wages by bringing in a lot of low-skilled, low-wage workers. Uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, there are complementarities uh, that increase the incomes of native-born people. Uh, so uh, if, yeah. if everybody was an Albert Einstein, then that means Albert Einsteins would be mowing the lawn and changing beds. Uh, but if, uh, if there are only a few Einsteins... Uh, Bringing in more immigrants to do the other work uh, frees up Einstein to do the Einsteiny things. So, uh, if we bring in a lot of immigrants to do low skilled work, it allows uh, native born Americans to specialize in uh, in other activities and uh, and higher value activities, uh, and that can boost output per head. And it it seems that that has has happened at least to some extent. Um, we also, in addition to to being uh, to, to screening uh, low-skilled uh, workers were, were very uh, uh, unwelcoming uh, towards uh, high-skilled workers with grad degrees and so forth. We have many, many uh, people come from all over the world to study at our universities. We train them. We expend resources to get them uh, uh, degrees, and then we kick them out, uh, which is really crazy. Uh, so uh, when I'm looking around for policies to boost output per capita, 
I think it's the import, the immigration restrictions on high skilled workers that look especially crazy uh, and especially in urgent need uh, of change. Uh, uh, that said, for humanitarian reasons, because I believe in freedom and the freedom to, to move is one of the most basic freedoms at all. I don't think that freedom should be interfered with, except unless you have very, very good reasons. Uh, for that reason alone, I'm in favor of more uh, uh liberal immigration, regardless of its effect on growth. Un understood, understood. At, at some level, it's just arithmetic. The marginal new participant in the economy, the immigrant, enters both the numerator and the denominator. Yes. You know, there are more people, but we're talking about output per head. There's more output, there's more people. If that marginal person is not as productive as the average person, then the uh, output per capita gets pulled down by their coming in rather than being pulled up. But that marginal yeah, that's, person, so that's, person, you know, yeah. that's true. That's true for U.S. statistics. It's not true for world statistics. If you move somebody from a poor country to a rich country and his yeah. income goes up a lot, then that that increases global GDP per uh, per capita. But it doesn't uh, looking just at U.S. Nice. OK, so let's talk about these other two factors. Well, uh, capital deepening. I mean, so investment's got to be important here if uh, people are willing to put their money into building more you know, factories, investing in plant and equipment and so on that makes workers more productive. Presumably we get growth out of that. Uh, if they're all concerned about financial capital, they're not investing in real equipment and the money is flying around the world to seek the highest return uh, from whatever investment portfolio, then uh, maybe that's not so good for growth. Do I get that right? Yeah, so... Uh, yes. So for, in general, uh, more investment in physical capital per worker raises the productivity of workers, uh, allows output to rise, allows living standards to rise. Um, but before talking about physical capital, let me talk about human capital, because that's an important part of the story. Very good. Um, um, I said, uh, you know, that uh, uh, about the most straightforward way to get uh, more GDP per capita is to get a higher percentage of people making GDP. If you can't do that, the next best thing uh, is to make those people making GDP smarter and more skillful so that they can make more GDP per, per hour. Uh, we uh, did that over the course of the 20th century with a huge uh, investment in mass schooling. Uh, in 1900, the high school graduation rate in the United States was only 6%. Uh, by 1960, it was 70%. Um, the college graduation rate in 1900 was an asterisk. Uh, now, about a third of Americans uh, graduate four-year universities. Um, so we've had a huge increase in educational attainment uh, and, uh, and uh, going with that, uh, uh, an enormous change in the occupational structure. So we have many more uh, white collar office workers rather than, uh, than factory workers and farm laborers. Um, uh, but, uh, at least as measured in educational attainment, the upskilling of the American workforce has slowed way down, uh, since the 1970s. The high school graduation rate today is about the same as it was, uh, in 1970. It actually went down, uh, after the early 70s and only recently has recovered. Um, and test scores at high school are flat. So we're, ne we're neither educating more people nor educating them better at the secondary level. Uh, at the college level, uh, we do see continuing increases in, in uh, college education percentages, college graduation percentages, but only among women. Among men, the, high, the college graduation rate uh, is about the same today as it was in 1980, uh, despite the fact that the premium for having a college degree, the extra wages you get, uh, uh, almost doubled uh, since 1980. Uh, okay. So we've had a, a puzzling lack of of, uh, of investment in human capital uh, that has slowed down uh, skill development and and therefore slowed down growth. Okay, uh, so that leaves physical capital. Um, well, the, before, but hold, on, hold on, hold on. I, I'm sorry to interrupt the game, but yeah, on the human capital question, you are confident that it's real productivity increment that is being measured when we see higher wages for someone graduating from college. The reason I ask the question is that it certainly could be that college does nothing. People are sitting around reading a bunch of books. It doesn't make them any more effective on their job, except identify individuals who are smarter and are more productive by virtue of being smarter. And the smarter individuals tend to go to college. So the college premium is a measure of the smartness premium, not a measure of actual productivity enhancement due to going to college. Yeah, what, yes. what, what makes uh, you so confident that of that? I, 
I, I grant that educational attainment as a measure of human capital is extremely imperfect because it may simply measure. So the question, why do people make more money if they go to school longer? Yeah. Uh, is it is it uh, there's two basic answers, uh, the human capital answer and the signaling answer. The human capital answer is they learn something important that they applied in the workforce that they yeah. can then apply in the workforce. The signaling answer is that the degree simply signals pre-existing qualities in that individual. That's a smart person. He got into college because he's smart. He didn't learn anything in college, but uh, he stuck with it for four years, and the degree signals that. So yeah. we know we have a smart person who's reasonably conscientious. Uh, and so even if they didn't learn anything in the four years, the degree acts as a signal. Uh, so, uh, regardless of, of, and I, oh, which of those explains, uh, higher, uh, earnings for more educated people, I, I think both, uh, uh, play a role. Um, but, uh, even if it's all signaling, uh, that means, uh, that there's only a, there's only a fixed quantity of smart people in society, which is kind of a grim uh, way of thinking about things. Um, and if the price for them is going up, uh, as, as evidenced by the rising skill premium, then we're still hitting some kind of supply constraint, uh, where once upon a time we had kind of a surplus army of smart people that we could throw, uh, at new occupations, uh, that required, uh, higher levels of cognitive skill. Uh, we could move smart kids from the farm into the offices. Uh, but if now all smart people are doing cognitively demanding tasks and there are no more, uh, then growth will be starved by the uh, by the absence of this surplus reserve army of smart people. Uh, so I don't buy that. I, be, I buy that education actually uh, does and can raise skill levels, and therefore uh, we can continue to upskill our workforce. Uh, yeah. But we, uh, it, by all appearances, we have been doing that at a much slower rate uh, in recent decades than we did for much of the 20th century, and we are paying a growth price for that. Very good. Okay, so physical capital. Yeah, so physical capital, uh, more capital uh, is, is a good thing, but uh, at attempting to determine some quantitative relationship between investment levels and growth levels is extremely tricky uh, because the quality of investment matters every bit as much as the quantity in, of investment. If you try to, once upon a time, economists thought about these things in very mechanical ways, and it led them uh, into all kinds of embarrassing errors, uh, like thinking that the Soviet Union uh, was going to overtake uh, the U.S. economy uh, because of its incredibly high investment levels. Uh, people thought, uh, uh, and you can look back at old uh, 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 Paul Samuelson uh, textbooks uh, and see these graphs of of uh, Soviet GDP and U.S. GDP and anticipating when uh, Soviet GDP would overtake U.S. GDP. And the, in the first of those graphs in an early 60s version of the textbook, uh, the uh, intercept point was eerily at 1984. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but all of that was based on this idea that command economies had this huge advantage over market economies that yeah. they could – Engage in forced saving. They could yeah. uh, they could take all the surplus <laughs> resources from their workforce, and they could invest it in heavy industry, and they could uh, accelerate progress by uh, by this forced mobilization of resources. That assumed, however, that those mobilized resources would be invested efficiently, uh, and of course, they weren't. Uh, so, uh, quality of investment matters every bit as much as quantity. But on the quantity side, it looks like the net investment rate has been going down over time uh, with uh, with the falling uh, savings rate. Uh, and so uh, uh, at the very least, we can say that there's, there, there does not seem to be any kind of investment boom under underway that would compensate uh, for the slower uh, uh, labor force growth or the slower growth in skill levels. Okay, but uh, I got to so ask you this. leaves innovation, uh, uh, yeah, and, and I know called what, total factor productivity growth, and, and, and that is the big imponderable. Okay, but but I got to ask you this about investment, which is even if the savings rate within the U.S. economy is low, what's to keep people off offshore from the United States who have capital to invest from seeing the U.S. Yes. as an attractive and, place to put and, their and money? And so our, our investment has suffered less than the fall of our savings rate because we run big uh, uh, current account deficits. That is, we import capital from the rest of the world. Right. Um, but uh, but uh, we. Uh, even though we talk a lot about globalization, uh, national boundaries still matter a lot, uh, and capital uh, still shows a decided preference to be invested at home over being invested abroad. Uh, so uh, uh, there are limits uh, to the degree to which uh, 
Uh, you can compensate for deficient savings at home with or with uh, extra investment from abroad. Um, and and so uh, even factoring in our growing reliance on foreign capital, it still appears that our overall investment rate uh, has been declining. Very good. OK, so let's close out with a discussion about uh, why you are more optimistic than Robert Gordon is about uh, the future of uh, technological innovation to boost growth in the United States. Yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, um, <clears throat> in these debates about whether we're running out in good around uh, good ideas, uh, the, the the leading uh, exponents of the two poles of, of opposing thought have been Robert Gordon on the one hand and Eric Brynjolfsson at MIT on the other. Uh, they did a, a TED Talk uh, debate uh, that was widely viewed, and uh, I had both of them on a panel at a, a conference of the Cato Institute back in December where they uh, reprised that debate. Um, and, cool. uh, Brynjolfsson has this lovely metaphor, uh, about the second half of the chessboard, uh, which, uh, refers back to the tale of the, uh, of the, uh, the, <clears throat> some wise man who was called upon to counsel the king and he was asked for his price. And he said, uh, I just want one, uh, get a chessboard, put one grain of rice on the first square, right. two grains on the second square, four grains on the third square, doubling yeah, yeah. and so on, on and on. Yeah. The king says, great, that's nothing. No problem. Uh, and, uh, and so takes the advice and, uh, and then it's time <laughs> for the payout. And, uh, by the time he gets, uh, to the second half of the chessboard, he realizes that each new increment of rice is as big as everything beforehand. And, uh, <laughs> and well before you get to the end of the chessboard, it will consume all the wealth of his kingdom. Uh, so uh, he has the advisor killed. Uh, but the moral of the story is that exponential growth can take you by surprise. Um, uh, it can <clears throat> go along for years or decades and, and look like nothing statistically and then just start mounting uh, very, very rapidly. Uh, and exponential growth is what we have with Moore's Law. Uh, uh, basically computing power doubling every couple of years. Uh, you do that uh, through enough iterations, you start getting just ginormous increases in computing power every two years and therefore amazing new potentialities on the, on the, uh, uh, on the technological frontier. And Brynjolfsson argues, uh, that, uh, that we are, we are now entering that phase. And it does certainly seem to be the case, at least impressionistically, uh, that a whole bunch of uh, of things that were once thought to be completely beyond the realm of computers or robots to handle, uh, things like driving cars uh, uh, or uh, uh, <clears throat> playing Jeopardy in natural language, uh, now uh, it's uh, computers can do them fine. The combination of of uh, uh, big data and and pa pattern recognition has enabled uh, computers to uh, to engage in all kinds of tasks that we previously thought you absolutely had to have a human being do. Uh, so uh, I think the possibility for uh, continued huge productivity gains thanks to the Internet uh, and, and the ongoing march of computing power and automation uh, are are huge, I think. That on but, but, but wait the, on a minute, the, wait, 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 wait a minute. What happened to the law of di diminishing returns? Moore's law is not a, it's not a law. It's an empirical observation of what's been the yeah, case in the recent that, past. Why should agreed. I expect that that can go on forever? But it, yeah, but it, it only has given now uh, what we're talking, what each new increment of additional computing power means, uh, each new cycling of Moore's law means uh, in terms of additional computing power. We only need a few more iterations uh, to, uh, to get to, uh, you know, to okay. where things that <clears throat> seem magic today will seem commonplace. Um, and, uh, the best accounts that I'm reading about trends in the semiconductor industry and trends in the computer industry in general suggest that exponential growth of the computing power is not running out of gas. Uh, so uh, until it does, we're on an amazing ride. Uh, and, uh, and if it continues, uh, again, it's imponderable. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, dare to make any firm predictions, uh, but uh, I think there's good reason to think it will continue for some time and that the benefits that that will make possible uh, are huge. Uh, looking past uh, IT and, and computers um, to uh, medicine and biology, uh, I think that uh, the chance for uh, transformative new therapies to uh, extend life and even to reverse aging 
uh, are very possibly uh, going to be things that uh, that happen during the 21st century. If those do eventuate, then we could have, again, uh, really transformative uh, improvements in the human condition. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I don't know what is going to happen. But the idea that I'm sh- that I'm confident that nothing interesting and nothing transformative is going to happen, I, I can't I can't buy that. So I'm I don't stand with Gordon. I got it. OK, so we're going to close out. Let me just ask you finally. Um, I mean, you did mention a little bit about policy and talking about things that we're doing that discourage people from working, the way programs are organized that implicitly tax work, slowing down growth in uh, hours per uh, capita and therefore being not a good thing for growth. Are there other areas of the policy uh, domain where you think a growth, uh, you know, a growth focused uh, policy would do things differently than the way we're doing them now? Well, that's a that's a huge kettle of fish. Maybe we'll do a, a subsequent talk just about that. Uh, let okay. me just do a teaser uh, here. Uh, back in December, I held this conference on the future of U.S. economic growth with a lot of uh, big names from uh, uh, from academia and uh, uh, who were there. Um, the last two sessions uh, involved. Well, what do we do about this? What are uh, what are the uh, what are the policy changes that might uh, allow us to rejuvenate uh, growth rates going forward. Uh, in addition to those two panels, uh, I assembled a big online growth forum uh, where 51 different economists and policy experts uh, uh, with a very ideologically eclectic mix, uh, as well as a very prestigious and influential mix of people. Uh, I asked all of them the same question. I said, uh, if you could wave a magic wand and change just one or two policies to improve uh, the long-term uh, economic growth prospects of the United States. What would you do and why? Give me a thousand to two thousand words. Yeah. Uh, and I uh, got those fifty-one essays uh, and put them up uh, on the Cato website. I'm cool. sure uh, we can put uh, links to uh, both the conference uh, where we've got archived video and to those essays, so that people who are interested in how we dig our way out of this hole uh, can find. Uh, lots of interesting proposals there. Very good, Brink. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on and talking about growth prospects in the U.S. in the future. And, uh, you know, we'll call it a day. All right. Great talking to you, Glenn. Look forward to chatting with you again sometime soon. Me too. Bye-bye.